Okay, so I'm Nikki Isbell. I'm, uh, I'm a kidney specialist and I work across the PA. If I'd known just how close we were here, I would have walked here instead of doing a big loop around the suburb. But anyway, we've got a lovely facility here. And so thank you very much. I've uh, got some slides, but I did think that as this was a small group session, it might be nice at the end just to open it up for discussion and we can talk more about, uh, about things that you're interested in and areas that you've got questions uh, on. Uh, nope. Right, okay. Seems like done. All right, so look, the kidney, um, the, ki the kidney is a really uh, important organ of the body and it's not surprising that it is affected by amyloid because at any one time about 20% of your blood is being filtered by the kidney, all right? So uh, it's not surprising that disorders that cause abnormal proteins to float around in the, in the liquidy part of the blood called the plasma uh, end up being filtered out by the kidney because the kidney's job is essentially to, 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 to uh, sieve the blood and, and to, to uh, clear it of waste products. So when there are abnormal proteins within the serum, or the plasma, then, uh, then the kidney is exposed to, to those uh, in very large amounts. So it's not at all surprising. And in fact, amyloid's not the only uh, disease where proteins are filtered out uh, by, by the kidney because they're present in blood and they react with some component of the kidney. It's a very common mechanism of injury to the kidney in other diseases as well. But what makes this special, of course, is, is that the proteins from amyloid form the uh, beta-pleated sheets and fibrils, which you will be well aware of uh, from the talks from the haematologist. But I'll talk a little bit about that. And again, just as, uh, as it is in every other uh, you know, uh, discussion about amyloid, is classified by the protein that, um, that is deposited within the kidney. And that it all looks to a large extent very similar and the damage it does to the kidney is often very similar to, regardless of what type of amyloid uh, that you actually have. But some have a particular liking for the kidney and even uh, uh, in other uh, diseases uh, again there are things about the protein itself which, uh, which uh, make, sure, make that protein uh, particularly troublesome to the kidney. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kidneys because uh, they're a bit of an overlooked organ. They're clearly very important and fascinating and full of uh, very interesting facts, but uh, people often uh, don't know that much about, about the kidneys. So the anatomy is very straightforward. Uh, you've got two kidneys, uh, no laser pointer, um, and uh, they sit up behind uh, the ribs and they make the urine which is uh, passed down into the bladder to the outside. So again, um, you can see uh, the kidney is, uh, is very intricately, is it working now, this one? Yeah, yeah, yep. good. Okay, so the kidney, and I'm gonna talk a little bit. So this is the cortex of the kidney here, which is where all the little sieving uh, apparatus is. And I'll show you a picture of that uh, in a minute. And I was just gonna talk you uh, through the functions of the kidney and what happens when the kidneys don't work. So the kidney has many tasks and uh, some of them are related to the production of urine uh, and uh, in, intricate in that, but it has other jobs in terms of production of hormones, which people often don't appreciate. And I will talk through those a little bit as well. So obviously, the, the, you know, if you ask people, what do the kidneys do? Well, they're very major role in balancing salt and water intake. And if you think about the huge variety of environments that people can live in uh, and still have normal kidney function and normal blood creatinine, people can live in the middle of the Simpson, well, they don't live in the middle of the Simpson, but you can, you know, live in a very dry environment and not, uh, and very hot and not drink much water to people who drink litres and litres and litres of water. And they maintain their blood chemistry exactly the same. So that if you're a person, I saw someone the other day who drinks eight litres of Coca-Cola, um, for whatever reason, and the, you know, his blood biochemistry is the same as somebody who drinks two litres of ultra pure water because the kidneys are so good at being able to deal with all of that environmental uh, stress. And again, the amount of salt varies enormously. In Western diet now, we consume so much salt that is often hidden uh, and the kidneys are able to deal with that whilst they are able to function normally. Once your kidneys start to be impacted by disease, your ability to handle both salt and water starts to become impaired. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. 
So just as I mentioned before, in spite of whatever you eat, you can eat, it doesn't do you any good to, you know, to drink six litres of Coke or eat Kentucky Fried or whatever else, but your body is designed to keep your blood biochemistry in, in a safe range and it does so in a very tight, tight range. So things like your blood calcium, you know, is only changing by milli, you know, little micromolar differences every day to, regardless of what you eat and drink. So its other very important job uh, is, is to clear the waste products of metabolism. So cells are generally t are turning over all of the time, you eat. So you have to get rid of the, of the waste products of metabolism and that is made into urea, uh, which is then cleared out by the kidneys and filtered in the kidneys. Again, people often don't appreciate how important the, uh, the kidney is in clearing drugs that you might take, or right, medicines, I don't mean, um, you know, narcotics, <laughs> they're metabolised by the liver, <laughs> but uh, as is alcohol. Um, but they clear are certain drugs which are entirely cleared by the kidney, and it's a very important mechanism by which they, they, they are regulated. And they control, and the kidneys also control the acid-base balance of the kidney, along with the lungs, has an important role in that. And the hormones, it forms the active form of vitamin D. People always think vitamin D sun, yes, that's step one, but in order for vitamin D to work, it's made in the skin, then travels to the kidney to become what's called activated, which is the powerful form or the, 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 the vitamin D that actually does something. So without your kidneys, you actually produce much less of the active form of vitamin D. EPO is the uh, hormone that, um, that makes red blood cells, okay, so it's made in the kidney and travels to the bone marrow to drive the production of red blood cells. This is the uh, substance that the cyclists use, Lance Armstrong was very fond of this uh, and, uh, and uh, you could, uh, there was a very large, I suppose there probably still is a very large black market in erythropoietin, but your kidneys make it normally and when their functions start to drop off you can uh, become anemic. So again, all right, so what happens when the kidney function is disturbed and uh, some of these functions are, are lost? So what happens if you disturb your salt and water balance? And many of you are probably familiar with what medically termed is a, uh, as edema, uh, which is swelling uh, initially of the feet, but the edema, and in people with amyloid, very commonly can, uh, can progress up and involve swelling of the whole body um, and uh, the fluid excess can be quite extreme and sometimes difficult to control. So it initially starts on the feet and you can tell that uh, by pushing it in and it leaves a dent or you can see that you've got a trace of edema when you have your socks on and take your socks off and there's a band from where your socks are sitting. Um, and if it gets very severe, you can start to become short of breath as the excess fluid can build up in your lungs. It also keeps the blood chemistry in the safe range. And the one we, we talk about sometimes is potassium. So potassium is in all foods uh, and uh, the kidney struggles to control this as the uh, function starts to, uh, to, to decline down to sort of seriously low levels. Uh, and so we'll often ask dietitians to speak to people about, you know, the diet and making sure that uh, they're both uh, keeping the salt down but also keeping potassium, for example, down. Particularly at this time of year, it's very difficult um, to, uh, to keep potassium down because it's very um, important. It's a big part of things like cherries and the stone fruit are particularly high in potassium, as are grapes uh, and bananas and celery. <laughs> Most people don't have much trouble giving up the celery, but giving up the grapes <laughs> is, uh, is more difficult. And as I said before, it clears the products of metabolism. So if you can't complete, get rid of those waste products, then the symptoms are very non-specific and they're often shared by other you know, components of illness. But fatigue is, is certainly a part of it. Uh, nausea and poor appetite once your kidneys start to get down to very low levels of function are some of the uh, more commonly described. But things like loss of concentration, uh, disturbed sleep, uh, all sort of very uh, kind of subtle signs of, of advanced kidney disease. But you can have no symptoms at all of kidney failure, all right, until you lose. And some people, every year we see people who come in off the street who've got about three or four percent of their overall kidney function who just say, I'm a bit tired or I might have gone off my food. 
So, you know, they are one end of the spectrum. And then there are other people who will start to become symptomatic at a, when their kidney function sort of, certainly once you start to get below 20%, you start to have some of these symptoms and, and side effects from, uh, of not having adequate kidney function. But it's very variable and you can lose, as I said, up to 80% of your kidney function and not have any symptoms uh, of that at all. So that is often why kidney disease is so slow to be diagnosed because the only you know, way you find out about it is by doing a blood test. Itch is also a common problem uh, once you've got very significant kidney problems. I talked a little bit about before, about uh, getting rid of drug, uh, clearing drugs from the body and the doses of some drugs will need to be changed uh, depending on what your kidney function is. Uh, some of the diabetic medicines, for example, like metformin is a very commonly uh, used example of a particular drug that is completely cleared by the kidneys. Uh, and so that, that if you're on it and your kidney function is declining, you'll need to, to alter the dose. We always recommend that people don't take drugs like non-steroidals, like Nurofen, uh, etc., because uh, they can injure the kidney and have some damage to the kidney. So it's very important that if you have kidney disease and uh, people are often on quite complex medicines or wanting to you know, see a GP and have a new medicine, just for you know, it to be recognised that, uh, that sometimes those doses need to be changed or in some cases the drugs can uh, need to be avoided. Uh, we can replace both of these active vitamin D and erythropoietin and we do uh, very frequently in patients who have kidney disease. Oops. So back to this, so how, how does the kidney actually do all of these you know, amazing things? So that's the, a, a picture of the kidney I showed you before and this is the cortex here which is I described and if you take a section of that, this is the uh, business unit of the, of, the, um, of the kidney called the nephron from, from Greek. My Greek's not very good, I don't actually know what nephron means now, I think I used to but I don't now. But it is a Greek word and it is just describes this entire unit here and I'll just talk it through a little bit because there are some, I guess, some things that, uh, that may help you understand why the kidney gets damaged in amyloid and why it then, when it gets damaged, why it can't do the functions that it does. So blood comes in and then immediately goes through a capillary network of little filters called the glomerulus, all right? And this is like a, a blood sieve essentially, and that's the bit that predominantly gets damaged in amyloid because that's where the sieving is, is, is happening and that's where the proteins are being exposed to the kidney tissue. And the design of the kidney is special in that it, it, it's got quite big pores in it so that proteins and fluid can move across it. So therefore the proteins actually can get out into the tissues where in other organs the, those proteins are, are often more protected from the tissues. So that's why we think the kidney might be so vulnerable to this. So then you make what is called pre-urine really and then it goes through a series of different tubules and is refined to finally make it into the finished urine product, all right? This is a very energy intensive process. These cells here in this part of the tubule contain more of the energy generating mitochondria than any other cell in the body. So they're very dependent on energy. Uh, and make energy. So they get damaged in circumstances where blood pressure is low or blood oxygen is low uh, and, and they can't control or make the urine properly, which again is partly why you have a problem with salt and edema and water regulation is because there's damage to this sort of tubular structure here, which is the refining part. So glomerulus gets damaged Lots of protein goes into your urine, and I'll talk a bit about that. But you also then have problems in regulating the salt and water balance because this part of the kidney is damaged, and it's very energy intensive. So this is a, uh, a glomerulus, just to show you. This is a sort of little capillary loops. This would be magnified by, I think, about, uh, about 40,000 times uh, its actual size. And you've got about a million of these little filters in your kidneys, evenly spaced between your two kidneys. Uh, and they are an extraordinary structure that's designed to normally keep proteins and blood cells into the bloodstream and, but allow waste products and fluids and electrolytes and things to pass out into the urine. So that's what gets damaged in amyloid. All right. 
So again, you know all of this about amyloid from other, other talks and I've spoken a little bit about it now. So you get deposition of this insoluble beta pleater sheet within, beta pleater, beta pleater sheet within, the, within the kidneys um, and you get leakage of protein into the urine because that filtration barrier is disrupted. And that can be the amyloid protein, which is overflowing and going into the urine. And you'll know that that part of the testing and workup for, for amyloid is to test the urine for the amyloid proteins and light chains in the urine. But that's not the only protein that's in the urine. There's grams and grams and grams of normal sort of blood proteins in the urine because of the damage to that little that filtration barrier so that the proteins just instead of staying in the blood they go out into the urine where they don't belong and it gives us a marker of what's going on in the kidney and the amount of damage that's occurring to the kidney uh, and all of this causes scarring and then reduces kidney function so the first thing is is that you get leakage of proteins into the urine followed then by scarring of, of the kidney and loss of kidney function so how do we measure kidney health? I said before, you, you couldn't possibly, you don't want to wait till you get symptoms of kidney disease. So it's very important to test kidney function and people will often be quite surprised when they have a blood test. And in fact, a number of people I've seen with amyloid, this is how the whole thing starts, is, is that they have a blood test and their kidney function is abnormal. And then there's starting to be some thinking about why their kidney function is abnormal. Now, I put this in italics because blood pressure is different in, in, most, in, in many, but not all types of amyloid. Mostly with chronic kidney disease, blood pressure is high. It's a part of the hallmark of kidney damage is that blood pressure will often go up. Not the case always in amyloid where often blood pressure can be very low uh, and that then has its own problems uh, in terms of uh, maintaining kidney function because sometimes the blood pressure can be very low. But then we do tests to measure the clearance of waste. And we do that by two different uh, molecules, which you'll see on a routine blood form. One of them is called urea, which is just a protein, the end product of protein metabolism made in the liver, goes to the kidneys and is cleared by the kidneys. So we can easily measure urea uh, in the blood. We also measure serum creatinine, which is a, a normal waste product of muscle. All right, so there's just a normal standard turnover of muscle every day. And you actually turn over the same amount of muscle pretty much every day. So it's a standard constant for you. So it actually gives us something that's very uh, stable to measure. Uh, and it's all not entirely cleared by the kidneys, but mostly that's the only way that this waste product of muscle turnover is able to get out of the body. So it's actually a really good marker, a natural marker in the blood to do it because urea will go up and down depending on whether you've eaten a lot of protein. If you go and uh, eat, I don't know, uh, a lot of protein, <laughs> a protein shake or something, uh, then you can push your urea up. Uh, but creatinine tends to be more stable. But it... it differs between people uh, in that some people have a lot of muscle and some people only have a little bit of muscle. So you need to do something with the, the raw number of creatinine to make it more reflective of what that person's muscle build and age is. So you would not expect that creatinine for someone who is in their 70s and female and slightly built will have a different creatinine to someone who is in their 20s and plays football. Okay, So uh, the creatinine of a footballer in a 70-year-old woman would be clearly very abnormal. So we have a formula, and I haven't put the formula up because it's quite complex, lots of, you know, to the power of and divided by. But it, essentially this takes the creatinine and the age and gender of the patient and turns it into a number which can be compared across groups. All right, so normal GFR is about 100 to 120, depending on your age. Uh, it, there is a little bit of a drift downwards in time. We would say that you have significant kidney injury once your GFR gets less than 60. By the time it gets down to 30, you're starting to maybe get some symptoms. And we say that you've got end-stage kidney disease once it sort of gets less than somewhere between 5 and 15. So you start off close to 100, and then it can be uh, drift down till you get down to somewhere around 7 or 8. We're looking at putting people onto dialysis. So that sort of gives you a bit of an idea. And, and doctors in particular will talk to you about what your eGFR is doing. So that makes it easier for people who are built differently 
to be able to comp compare what uh, what their kidney function actually is. So, because serum creatinine is uh, is is different depending uh, on uh, on your size and build. So that that's just one little bit of tips to you know when uh, you have your blood test done. That's what we're looking for. We test your urine protein. They used to do it <laughs> by by frothing it up and you'll notice that uh, anybody who's got large amounts of protein in their urine, very astute people will sometimes go to their doctor and say, I've noticed my urine is frothy. <laughs> and that's because there's lots of protein in there and the protein changes the surface tension of it and it will froth, all right? Uh, back in the day, you used to boil it and work out how much protein was in there because it would sediment when it was boiled, uh, but we don't do that anymore. Uh, we do still dipstick your urine and that will tell us what amount of total protein in, is in there but it's very important to remember that does not give you any information about light chains. All right? You have to do light chains by doing a special test and uh, just because people will use this terminology, light chains in urine are called Bentz jones proteins after the people who discovered them. So that will be a terminology which will still be used but we now get more information about what those light chains are, uh, even for people who have AL amyloid of course, um, by, by doing special tests on the urine, the same way that they do essentially the same as checking in the blood. So uh, that's just a little bit about what we do. So just to go backwards a bit, so why might your doctor think someone has got amyloid? So edema is a very common feature of this condition. In fact, all conditions of the kidney that involve loss of large amounts of protein into the urine are associated with salt and water retention and edema. So that's often a clue. The blood pressure may be low, a bit of a clue, lots of protein in the urine, abnormal kidney function. And again, a little bit of a clue is, is that when kidneys uh, scar up from other kidney diseases, mostly they start to shrink and get small and scarred, all right? Amyloid is different because that protein is being deposited within the kidneys. The kidneys actually get a little bit bigger. So sometimes the ultrasonographers will say these are, you know, kidneys are looking a bit larger than, nor than normal. And it's just a clue. It's not diagnostic, but it is a bit of a clue. But at this stage, when you have this sort of information, it still could be any other of many kidney diseases. So then in order, unless you have a diagnosis otherwise made, is that a kidney biopsy is often performed. So this is an ultrasound of the kidney. Uh, they don't always look this easy to interpret, I might add. <laughs> this is a beautiful picture. Everybody's a bit different. Sometimes it's harder to see uh, and, uh, and uh, you can have a look at how big the kidneys are and whether there are any scarring or other things. And then we'll do an, a, a biopsy using a biopsy spring-loaded needle. You have to lie on your tummy, uh, put your arms above your head, hold your breath. Uh, and then uh, the person doing the procedure will take a tiny little piece of the kidney tissue out to look at underneath the microscope. So um, this is a very routine uh, test for, uh, for diagnosing many different types of kidney disease. Then it goes to the lab and you look at it down the microscope. So I put a normal one in just so for comparison. Okay, so this is the glomerulus that we were talking about before cut in cross-section and stained. The little purple dots are the, are the nuclei. These little fine things here are the blood vessels and this is the sort of supporting structure in here. And this is what happens when you have amyloid and this is any amyloid, all right? It doesn't matter if you've got AA or a hereditary amyloid or whatever you've got. It all, it, it, this is what it looks like. So these are the pink deposits of, of amyloid fibrils within the kidney. And this is a fairly early stage. You get them sometimes when they're just packed with amyloid and you, you lose the normal structure. But you can see the normal fine capillaries and things are starting to be significantly distorted and disturbed. Then there are special stains, and these are beloved of medical students and people studying for physicians' exams because if, if as soon as someone says Congo red positive, it's just like, I know what that disease is. <laughs> That's amyloid. So uh, you can see uh, that that amount of amyloid, that, that glomerulus is just totally stuffed full of amyloid fibrils, isn't it? Because it's staining red with the Congo red stain. Uh, there's some in that, in that blood vessel as well. Sometimes you'll see it in the other parts of the kidney, so that's not uncommon, but the glomerulus for the large part is where the action is. 
And the other thing that everybody, you know, when you get a new diagnosis of amyloid is they put the polarised light on and make it shine this lovely apple green colour, you know. We, we have a fairly boring day sometimes. It's nice to go to the, to the lab when you're having a biopsy meeting and see, see pictures. Uh, and again, you can just see how much amyloid is, is in, that, in that kidney. So that equals amyloid. Okay, so we've got a diagnosis by this stage. There's no other conditions that would have that pattern. Okay, so we know now that this patient has got amyloid. This is under electron microscopy that's by magnified by 50,000 times. And you can see here that these little linear structures are the fibrils within the kidneys, a sort of random zigzaggy uh, mass of them. But then we need to work out, all right, the very, in very important part, it is important to make the diagnosis of amyloid, but even more important is to make a diagnosis of what sort of amyloid you have in your kidneys. And again, it's not always as straightforward as these pictures make out, but if you have AL amyloid, so a bone marrow producing or plasma cells which are making abnormal fibrils, then you can stain those light chains with special dyes which bind avidly to, uh, to, uh, to the deposits within the kidney. So we would stain the kidney sections for both uh, kappa and lambda light chain antibodies so that if there were any lambda light chains in the kidney, that dye would just hold on to them and then we shine some special light on it and we would be able to see them, whereas the other antibody would be completely negative. So we can then work out what sort of amyloid is being deposited in the kidney. And this is AA amyloid, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Not nearly as attractive a stain, brown, um, and, but again, you can see just stuffed full of it. And again, this special stain stands, stains up the, uh, the AA amyloid protein. And you can see that by using a combination of these special stains and electron microscopy, in conjunction with the blood work, you know, you have your serum light chains done and your urine light chains done, uh, we can then start to work out what the, what the type of amyloid is in the kidney. So then I was just going to talk a little bit about um, the different uh, amyloids. Now we always step back at this point and say, hematologists, come on, <laughs> you come on uh, and help us out now. Because often the nephrologist will, the patients will go to a nephrologist as part of how they come to, it, to attention. Um, and so AL amyloid, so it is about 70% of amyloid that we see in, in this country is related to AL amyloid, but it varies depending on where you work or where you live. The most common is light chains, although kappa can, uh, can damage kidneys as well. The most frequent is a, is a lambda light chain. And as I said before, the kidney may be the place where it starts. And if you don't treat this as well, you know the kidney disease can progress very rapidly. Uh, and the treatment is by haematologists. And how your kidneys do, this is why we kind of step back, because the haematologists then uh, use their uh, drug regimens to, to, uh, to, to work out what treatments people are going to have. As part of the other assessments, you need to have your heart tested and other things to work out how they're going to approach the treatment of amyloid. And really, the kidneys are bystanders here now. So however you're going to do from the kidney point of view depends on how well your haematology response is. So that if you uh, have a good haematological response, then you can see a reduction in proteinuria, and we've certainly seen it. It can take a while, and I was looking up last night just to see if I could find out what the average time was, and it's about a year <laughs> to get to get resorption. You can see how much amyloid is deposited in those kidneys. So, you know, we don't ever re-biopsy people to do a study of that, of course, because it's got its own risks, but we do measure the amount of urine protein total and the amount of light chain in the urine. And we do see an improvement. And if you are having a good hematological response, then you can see an improvement or a stabilization in your kidney function and a reduction in your protein urea. So the other type of amyloid uh, that uh, are the more common, or the second most common is that called AA. And it's associated with chronic inflammatory conditions. And if you were practicing in Africa, or uh, you know, this would be very much more common type of amyloid. In fact, if you were doing a biopsy series of people because of the risk of chronic infections, things like chronic malaria, for example, or chronic other you know bone infections in people who've had osteomyelitis for decades, um, then uh, then AA amyloid is much more common in that population. 
rheumatoid arthritis used to be associated with it, but now that the drugs for rheumatoid arthritis are so much better, it's much less common now to, uh, to, see, to see AA amyloid in, the, in that association. And it takes a long time, on average about 17 years, people have had the underlying cause before they are diagnosed with amyloid. And again, this type of protein really loves the kidney and is affected quite commonly in AA amyloid. And the treatment is that of the underlying condition. If you've got rheumatoid arthritis, you have uh, you know, an improved treatment for your rheumatoid, or if you have a chronic infection, to treat that. There are some very interesting new therapies to try and bind to those proteins in the kidney and disrupt them and allow resorption and clearance of them. And there are currently trials underway to, to, to see whether or not AA amyloid may have a new treatment on the horizon. So that's quite exciting. And then there are the hereditary amyloids, which are, of course, rare, uh, but very important for many reasons, many, many reasons to diagnose. AFib, we have some families of, of AFib and the transthyretin, the hereditary form of this, again, can affect the kidneys. So this is where, um, where Peter Millay and uh, his team, in terms of doing their laser dissection mass spec, can be very useful because these proteins can be dissected out and they actually quite keen for the kidneys to be involved because that actually gives you seeing how much amyloid is in the kidneys you can actually dissect a bit out of a sample and send it off for special testing to work out which protein it is and then going on to do the genetic testing to look for what the what the abnormality is and it's important because there's obviously implications for people's family members but also because sometimes these proteins well because these proteins are made in the liver the prospect of having a liver kidney transplant as a cure for this does exist. So just going to uh, talk a little bit more about what happens if your kidneys fail and I haven't put many slides in because I'm happy to discuss this further but but certainly amyloid can cause kidney failure in a, in a subset of people and sometimes people progress to the point where they need dialysis uh, and dialysis can sometimes be challenging particularly if people have cardiac involvement or serious gut involvement or other things so certainly uh, it can have its challenges. Transplantation for AL amyloid is difficult, uh, but if you have a hereditary form of, of amyloid, uh, we've, we've recently done a combined liver kidney transplant, which has done well. So, uh, yes, I was running this talk last night and that lightning was quite spectacular. Uh, what well, that wasn't from last night, but uh, I was just uh, looking at the pictures this morning. But anyway, so um, that's where I was going to stop, but I'm very happy to, to take questions. Um, about anything at all, really, about kidneys. <laughs> yes. Look, your um, your kidneys. Once you've formed them, they uh, the glomeruli f find it very difficult. The cells in there don't regenerate, but those tubular cells can regenerate. So sometimes people's creatinine goes up and down. For example, if you have a bad pneumonia or something, and you have some injury to your kidney on top of your amyloid, then you'll see an improvement in your creatinine. But that's because the damage on that occasion has been in the tubules, they can repair themselves, but the glomeruli don't regenerate. Uh, Melissa Little, who was in Queensland, you may have seen uh, her on the news and her animal models about regenerating kidneys, very exciting, but years off, uh, years off uh, being able to be employed in clinical practice yet. So. We, no one's done the studies, at least I know, where they repeat biopsies to see if, whether you can mobilise this. Certainly in the AA amyloid, there's some kind of interest that that new substance that they're trialling might be able to do that. Um, but, but yes, so you, it's all, if you have a relapse, then there, there will be another wave of injury to your kidney is a, is a bystander for this because it's filtering all that blood and as soon as the protein comes back, it starts filtering that protein again. Uh, in terms of the abnormal haematological side of things, uh, yes, I'm not a haematologist, so uh, not that well placed to talk about about the you know the laboratory stuff about what causes the abnormal cell clones. That's out of my uh, remit. There's a lot of interest in why particular types of the the protein, why some of them are you know precipitating kidneys, why some of them do more damage than others, and it's probably got to do with the structure of it and the way they fold. And so some of them are just easier to filter. You know, some of them, if they've got particular charges on them, the kidney is full of 
proteins that are negatively charged, so that if, this, if the protein has a positive charge to it or a particular shape to it, then they're more likely to, to bind to the kidney. But in terms of what's causing the abnormal clone of, uh, of plasma cells, that, that, that would be best asked to a hematologist, <laughs> I'm afraid. In terms of your kidneys, so if you have kidney damage, um, then certainly people always ask, one important thing is to say, all right, well, I'm losing a lot of protein in my urine. Should I eat more protein? Will that help? And it, and it doesn't, all right? Um, so uh, you just, we recommend that you eat a normal, healthy diet. Cholesterol will often go up in people who have a lot of protein in their urine. So we just suggest that people eat a healthy, healthy diet. Uh, and once your kidney function starts to get that GFR, starts to get down sort of around towards 20, we recommend that you might see a dietitian and just if potassium is starting to be an issue uh, about what foods contain a lot of potassium. People who have edema of any cause, salt is a problem and because your kidney thinks it needs to avidly retain any bit of salt that you eat. So we recommend that people who have edema of any cause to, to have salt, to have a low salt diet. So, but there's no, it, it really is just having a healthy, a healthy diet. Yeah, look, I think it's a bit of a bit of both. Um, is is that, and again, I'm not sure that the people people are wait too long for a diagnosis. I think is probably people have often seen multiple specialists and doctors before they get a diagnosis. They have non-specific symptoms. Chronic kidney disease is actually quite common in the in the community, and particularly. Again, things like diabetes. Like diabetes can look like amyloid in the kidney sometimes. It's the other condition where the kidneys are a bit big for their size. In people with bad diabetes, they have protein in their urine. And so people can make an assumption because diabetes is so common that the protein in the urine is from diabetes. And I think that, that that's an, a lack of awareness. Uh, so I think that, that from the diagnostic point of view, I think it's a late diagnosis, which is which is is a problem. Um, in that, GPs people don't test urine for protein, which is you know we we nephrologists you know go on and on and on and on and on about how much information you can get from dipsticking and testing urine. If you dipstick, you won't pick up the light chain, so you won't pick it at that stage. But you will pick up that there's lots of other proteins in the urine. So. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people do miss it, and you know, again, I put up the ideal sort of patient where you've got all of these things. Sometimes it can be tricky. Maybe the kidneys are not that affected, or someone's not test not testing the urine. Is, you know, is part of the problem. I think um, once you start, if you know that someone's got grams of protein in their urine, that is not normal, and it needs to be investigated. And so. From our point of view, is that's where the clue is in this. All a lot of the other symptoms are very non-specific and can be accounted for by many other things. But if you test the urine and there are three, four, five grams of protein in the urine, if it's not amyloid, it's something else serious. So <laughs> needs you need a biopsy to, to work it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and again, they'd be a bit worried about taking too much tissue as well. If it's in your bladder, not so bad. It's a nice, quite a, sort of thick-walled organ, but Things like in the gut also, same deal for people who've got amyloid in their gut, is, is that quite rightly, the people who do the colonoscopies are terrified about taking a huge, lovely, big piece of tissue to look down the microscope for fear that they put a hole in your gut, um, which is a very bad outcome. Um, so you know, again, they wanted the, the balance between taking enough tissue so that you can look for rare things um, as opposed to, you know, making harm because out of the, you know, I don't know, 20 colonoscopies you do on, you know, or 100 or 1,000 you do in a year, maybe, maybe one every two or three years will have amyloid. So, again, because it's rare, you've got to think about, you've got to have a high index of suspicion. But yet there is almost certainly everybody has stories of delayed diagnosis. All right. So, and for exactly that reason. Not hard to diagnose once you think about it, but you've got to think about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Eleven specialists, I think I saw some in some paper once that was, you know, eleven different doctors took to diagnose a case of amyloid. So, yeah. And, yeah, look, and the other thing, I guess, about amyloid is people are a little bit worried about biopsying things sometimes because 
I didn't show you a picture of it, but some of the, sometimes the amyloid protein deposits around the blood vessels. So if you stick a needle into something, uh, then the way that that stops bleeding is, is by constricting. All right. Some of it is um, by platelets and other bits of components of blood, but the constriction of the blood vessel is a key part of, part of this. So you always worry about sticking needles into things the way you think the diagnosis is amyloid because of the concern about the stiff tissues not contracting properly and there being a bleed so again and that's why if you've got it in the skin bruising is easy and you know there's other other things so we try and avoid in fact sometimes we will try and avoid doing a kidney biopsy if we can get the diagnosis another way so things like fat pad biopsies or rectal biopsies where it's um, less uh, risk of bleeding is uh, is is also the case because sometimes people with amyloid and do have a kidney biopsy do bleed a lot and if you have had a kidney biopsy i'm sure that when the doctor is doing the consent they will have made very clear that that they were concerned about the risk of bleeding and you know a part of the other thing about having amyloid is is that you've got to enjoy life and uh, if, if some people find that eating food with no salt in it is unpalatable well you know I guess you've got to balance out what what the game's all about so I usually tell people if, they've, if they can't breathe they can't eat salt <laughs> and if they've got a bit of swelling and they'd like to have some salt then then that's fine all right and I guess the other thing I suppose a bit off target is, is treatment of protein in the urine. Doctors will, particularly some specialists, will want to give you things that reduce the protein in your urine, uh, particular classes of blood pressure drugs, which are very difficult and almost never use them in, in people with amyloid just because they make the blood pressure too low. So, I mean, again, I guess it's just important to try and uh, you know the doctors who look after you will in many cases be learning about amyloid as you are because they may not have treated many other patients who have the condition just because you know they just don't they just don't see it it's not common